Hi there, our highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers, and listeners and welcome back to your channel of choice. This video I am about to present was compiled by Dr. Nath Arawa, a clinical pharmacist by training and profession who is the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants. The premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute with a Difference, where patient safety, medication therapy management and optimal clinical outcomes are very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services. So, on behalf of the Institute, I humbly urge you all to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you very useful tips which may prove very, very handy in your line of duty. I now welcome you all to part 483 of our pharmacotherapy series, which majors in hematopoietic cell transplantation. In this video we will discuss the case of patient TAW from part 482 of this pharmacotherapy series. TAW is started on voriconazole 6 mg per kilogram IV every 12 hours for two doses, followed by 4 mg per kilogram IV every 12 hours, plus caspofungin 70 mg IV on day 1 and 50 mg IV daily thereafter. My questions to you read. What toxicities can be expected with azole treatment? What is the rationale for combination therapy and how should the patient be monitored? How long should TAW receive antifungal therapy? Common toxicities reported with voriconazole include reversible visual disturbances, such as blurred vision, altered color perception, photophobia, and visual hallucinations, skin reactions, such as rash, pruritus, and photosensitivity, elevations in hepatic transaminase enzymes and alkaline phosphatase, nausea, and headache. Caspofungin has fewer adverse effects. Vein irritation and headache are most common. Dermatologic reactions related to histamine release, such as flushing, erythema, and wheels, have also been reported. Increased hepatic transaminase enzymes occur in approximately 6% of patients treated with caspofungin. TAW should be monitored for changes in liver function and counseled regarding the potential visual side effects of voriconazole. The azoles are also known inhibitors of the CYP3A4 isoenzyme. Therefore, drug interaction monitoring is imperative. The major interaction seen in patients undergoing allogeneic hematopoietic cell transplantation is an increase in calcineurin inhibitor levels. Careful monitoring is warranted. Data supporting improved outcomes with two drug combinations of triazoles, echinocandins, and polyenes in patients with aspergillosis are sparse. However, in vitro and animal data suggest that an echinocandin plus voriconazole or a polyene may be synergistic. Given the overall poor prognosis of invasive aspergillosis in severely immunocompromised patients, many practitioners choose to treat patients with two-drug combination therapy. Voriconazole in combination with caspofungin is thus a reasonable alternative for TAW. The optimum duration of antifungal therapy for treatment of invasive aspergillus cysts has not been established. Important considerations include the status of the patient's immune system and the extent of response to treatment. 
Many clinicians continue aggressive antifungal therapy until the infection has stabilized radiographically and then proceed with less aggressive maintenance therapy, e.g., single agent oral voriconazole, until restoration of the immune system has taken place. It is not uncommon for a patient to require several months of antifungal therapy for effective management of invasive aspergillosis. TAW is receiving TMP, SMX, one double strength tablet orally twice daily on Monday and Thursday. So my question to you reads, what is the rationale for its use? Pneumocystis gyrovechi is a common pathogen that causes pneumocystis pneumonia, abbreviated as PCP, in patients who have undergone allogeneic hematopoietic cell transplantation. Pneumocystis pneumonia is a potentially lethal infection, and prophylaxis is routinely administered. The optimum prophylactic regimen has not been established, but most centers administer TMP, SMX for pneumocystis pneumonia prophylaxis. Dapsin and aerosolized pentamidine are alternatives for patients who are allergic to sulfonamides or do not tolerate TMP, SMX for other reasons such as hematologic toxicities. Pneumocystis pneumonia prophylaxis is usually begun after neutrophil recovery because a. Pneumocystis pneumonia most commonly occurs after engraftment and b. TMP, SMX is potentially myelosuppressive. Patients should be closely monitored for unexplained neutropenia or thrombocytopenia. The next case reads, SHO is a 32-year-old woman who received a busylvan cyclophosphamide abbreviated as BU, CY preparative regimen and a human leukocyte antigen matched sibling hematopoietic cell transplantation for treatment of chronic phase chronic myeloid leukemia at age 21 years. SHO received her hematopoietic cell transplantation more than 10 years ago, is disease-free, and has not had chronic graft-versus-host disease for 9 years. Her only medication is one multivitamin tablet daily. So my first question to you reads, what issues of cancer survivorship are of concern to SHO? A greater proportion of hematopoietic cell transplantation recipients are surviving their cancer diagnosis without evidence of their primary malignancy, but they are at risk for long-term physical and emotional sequelae of their cancer treatments. Many long-term hematopoietic cell transplantation survivors are no longer under the care of a hematopoietic cell transplantation center, and their healthcare providers may be unfamiliar with the complications of hematopoietic cell transplantation. To facilitate the clinical care of long-term hematopoietic cell transplantation recipients, Recommendations for screening and preventive practices have been created for adult and pediatric hematopoietic cell transplantation survivors. These guidelines should facilitate the provision of health care to hematopoietic cell transplantation recipients. The following paragraphs describe various concerns associated with the morbidity of long-term hematopoietic cell transplantation survivors. Long-term hematopoietic cell transplantation survivors should be regularly screened for the development of secondary malignancies, complications of graft-versus-host disease that affect the oral mucosa, liver, respiratory, endocrine, ocular, skeletal, nervous system, kidney, and vascular systems. The psychosocial health of hematopoietic cell transplantation survivors should also be evaluated. Immune function can take more than two years to recover, even after discontinuation of immunosuppressants. 
Treatment of graft versus host disease exacerbates immune system defects, necessitating prophylaxis and vigilant monitoring for infectious complications. Fevers should be rapidly assessed and treated to prevent fatal infections. Recipients of hematopoietic cell transplantation also lose protective antibodies to vaccine-preventable diseases. Therefore, hematopoietic cell transplantation survivors need to be revaccinated for selected infectious diseases with due consideration for the risk of vaccination. Hematopoietic cell transplant survivors have a greater risk of secondary malignant neoplasms. An increased incidence of cancer of the skin, oral mucosa, brain, thyroid, and bone is observed after allogeneic hematopoietic cell transplantation, and an increased incidence of myelodysplasia and acute leukemia can occur after autologous hematopoietic cell transplantation for non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Survivors should avoid carcinogens, e.g., tobacco and be screened for secondary malignant neoplasms indefinitely. Long-term impairment of end-organ function may be due to the preparative regimen, infectious complications, either autologous or allogeneic grafts, and post-transplant immunosuppression, for allogeneic grafts only. Endocrine dysfunction, specifically of the thyroid, gonads, and growth velocity, is common. Adrenal insufficiency can result from long-term corticosteroid therapy used to treat graft versus host disease. Infertility is commonly observed after myeloablative hematopoietic cell transplantation secondary to the high doses of alkylating agents and radiation administered. Frequently, men become azoospermic, and chemically induced menopause develops in women. However, Pregnancies have occurred after hematopoietic cell transplantation. Up to 60% of hematopoietic cell transplantation recipients have osteopenia, most likely resulting from gonadal dysfunction and corticosteroid administration. A vascular necrosis due to corticosteroids can also occur. A significant portion, that is 15% to 40%, of hematopoietic cell transplantation survivors exhibit pulmonary dysfunction with variable symptoms, e.g., restrictive, or chronic obstructive lung disease, from multiple causes. Hepatic infections can occur in hematopoietic cell transplantation recipients through blood transfusions or, more commonly, because recipients or donors have a latent hepatitis viral infection. The prevalence of chronic hepatitis C ranges from 5% to 70% in long-term hematopoietic cell transplantation survivors. Because of this, cirrhosis and its complications may become an important late complication of hematopoietic cell transplantation. Hepatic dysfunction can also result from iron overload, which may occur secondary to multiple red blood cell transfusions administered during aplasia after myeloablative preparative regimens and before hematopoietic cell transplantation. Alopecia is a common late effect with busylvan cyclophosphamide abbreviated as BUCY as a cataracts with cytarabine total body irradiation abbreviated as CY, TBI. SHO should be routinely monitored for signs of relapse and chronic graft versus host disease. To lower the risk of infectious complications, she should be counseled to obtain prompt medical care for fevers or signs of an infection and she should be revaccinated if she has not done so since receiving her myeloablative hematopoietic cell transplantation. Thorough evaluation of end-organ function, including renal, hepatic, thyroid, and ovarian function, should be assessed at regular intervals. In addition, her bone mineral density should be determined, and SHO should be counseled on preventive measures for osteopenia, e.g., 
calcium supplementation. In addition to standard cancer screening tests, SHO should be closely monitored for secondary malignant neoplasms. So there you have it. Our highly esteemed viewers and listeners, that brings us to the end of this video. If it benefited you in any way, kindly remember to give it a thumbs up, to like it and to share it widely with your peers. Please leave your comments at the bottom. And if you haven't yet done so, I humbly urge you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I would like to promise you all that the very, very best is yet to come. Thank you very much for viewing this video. On behalf of our senior colleague, Dr. Nath Arawa, I sincerely appreciate your partnership, continued support and kind collaboration. We look forward to interacting with you in the next video, which will be part 484.